Hello everyone. Please note this session is being recorded. Greetings from the University of, of South Florida in Tampa. Thank you for joining us for this inaugural session of our Global Health Conversation Series. I'm Lynette Menezes and I oversee global programs for US of Health, which consists of the Medi colleges of medicine, nursing, public health and pharmacy. On behalf of USF Health International, I want to warmly welcome each of you and our many partners from around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to ravage the world with more than 31 million cases and nearly a million deaths. And some of you might have just seen this morning that they now anticipate a surge in some of the European countries, including the as well as the United States. This pandemic's destructive path has left no community untouched, with some populations bearing a disproportionate burden of the negative effects. Each day, we continue to learn more and more about SARS-CoV-2 because of the numerous research studies and clinical trials being conducted across the globe. We now have evidence that masks combined with physical distancing and disinfection reduces transmission. We also have a few tools now to provide evidence-based preventive and supportive care for patients with severe disease. But a cure eludes us for now, and the promise of a vaccine in the immediate future is what we await. Meanwhile, millions of people around the world continue to suffer the short and long-term effects of COVID-19 not just the debilitating physical ones, but also the psychological and economic effects from the drastic preventive measures implemented to mitigate transmission. The mental health impact of COVID-19 has not received sufficient attention, despite the wide ranging adverse effects on the social fabric of our communities. And therefore, we wanted to have this first session led by Dr. Christopher Kalibe to focus on the mental health impact of COVID-19 and how do we all cope with the limited resources at our disposal. Before I introduce Dr. Kalibe, I just wanted all of you to know that at the end of this presentation, we will have plenty of time for questions. So please go ahead and type in your questions in the chat box during the pre presentation and he will try and answer as many as he can. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker today and my colleague, Dr. Christopher Kalibe. Dr. Kalibe is an associate professor of psychiatry at USF Health's Morsani College of Medicine. He is both certified in psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. He is currently a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and serves as the co-chair of their media committee. Dr. Kalibe is also the AACAP liaison to the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Communications and Media. His primary clinical work has been in federally qualified health centers and juvenile corrections. Dr. Kalibe has extensive training in psychotherapy including trauma-focused therapies. He has numerous publications and presentations, including the effect of digital technologies on mental health, mind-body medicine, working in primary care settings, and preventing overdiagnosis and overtreatment. At USF Psychiatry, Dr. Kalibe started a special training track in integrative psychiatry in association with the Andrew Wiles Center for Integrative Medicine. He has been named a best doctor annually since 2008. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Kalibi. Hello, everyone. So thank you for that kind introduction. I hope my screen is shared and everything goes OK. I've set my timer, so hopefully I'll be able to get through everything and there'll be plenty of time for questions. All the slides we could spend more time on, but um, I will uh, probably just go through them relatively quickly and then we can come back and uh, answer the questions. 
I've named this talk, Don't Just Sit There, Adapt and Optimize in a Post-COVID World. I think people around the world tend to understand that mental health and physical health are very related, uh, even though in the West we tend to divide them a lot. And I'm borrowing the Don't Just Sit There from a really pertinent and, and neat book from a lady named Katie Bowman. Um, and it's about transitioning to, you know, standing and movement-based work. And a lot of us are, are sitting at home these days. And uh, that, so I thought it was quite pertinent. Um, I've written a lot and I've been involved a lot with the challenge of how we're going to move forward with all the digital obligations we have these days. Uh, this is balancing, you know, all we need to do for our work and for school, along with balancing social networking, entertainment and all that, which was quite a challenge even before COVID. And now we're more sort of dependent on our devices. Um, on the left is a, a review article that I uh, or, or edited and that's from the clinics in North America. And we had like 15 different authors, uh, each doing a mental health related uh, subject. So I'm sort of a generalist when it comes to digital and media related um, uh, topics. And I often start presentations with Odysseus and the Sirens here. Um, if you remember from the Greek legend that he wanted to hear the sirens so he had his uh, sailors tie him to the mast and they put wax in their ears so they didn't hear him. But I feel it's a little bit like it is with uh, digital technologies and information these days. We want to access it, but we're afraid about too much and all the negatives that can come with it. So uh, as, as I kind of mentioned, we're going to I'm going to start with some things that are COVID related and then I'm going to talk about the world you know, before COVID that still was a challenge and we still had problems and the end will be solutions and adaptations and hopefully we've got plenty of time for questions. Medscape uh, just recently came with a survey about stress, burnout and income. And this it was a worldwide, although, you know, it doesn't span the globe and it's mostly, you know, uh, American. So it's not a perfect survey, but you'll notice that even in this, the, these rich countries had percentages that are pretty high for people uh, indicating that they had to treat patients without appropriate PPE. Um, so just sort of indicating how not ready the world has been for something that, you know, could have been predicted and that, uh, you know, how overwhelmed uh, many systems have been uh, due to COVID. Furthermore, uh, in the same in the same survey, um, have you been diagnosed? So it was 5% in the US and 20% in Spain. So, you know, obviously healthcare workers are being uh, somewhat uh, higher, are at somewhat higher risk. Uh, any family members, once again, 25% in Spain. So some places really have a lot of family members. Uh, income changed, you know, 62% of US physicians, you know, have reduced income. Um, and has your burnout increased? And you know this is a, a issue in in the American medical system, and I think it's it's worldwide. I mean, when I've looked at surveys, it seems to be that being a healthcare provider is very difficult. And of course, this is physician focused, but I think it uh, reflects other healthcare providers too. I mean, it's just been a very stressful time to be a healthcare provider. Some s sitting and waiting and not doing anything and not having a job is stressful, and then being in the middle of treating people. Uh, in you know, in situations often without the right uh, tools or the right system around you to sort of provide the best possible uh, care. Also, healthcare workers have uh, issues related to people, you know, being concerned about and and you know the uh, fear and avoidance of them and stigmatization is an issue and has been an issue in previous uh, disease outbreaks and seems to be currently uh, something that we're uh, dealing with. And so, you know, it is uh, a bit of a fear that's overblown because most healthcare workers, if they do get infected, get it from the community, not from the hospital. And so uh, while the rates are a little bit higher to, you know, you know ostracize or shun people that are, um, you know, putting the, putting themselves at risk and, and helping, you know, to care for people is just clearly not the way we would like to move forward with this. Um, I think, everyone realizes we need to be prudent about how healthcare workers um, interact 
with patients and be careful and, and that the risks will be a little bit more, but we also need to be supportive and figure out ways to help them. Uh, I understand that there is a lot of support and, and clapping and stuff, but we just want to um, balance the, the response. So, and this is a, you know, the Canadian research group shows that the, um, the healthcare workers had a, a 0.14 versus a 0.10 in the population. So, you know, you could see that's like a, a 40% increase. Um, and the World Health Organization had to come out that that some healthcare workers are, you know, experience avoidance by their family or community. Um, and, you know, they're, this is making the situation more difficult. Now, more to an area that I've been working in a lot, the new media versus traditional media. And, you know, this uh, paper out of China talks about how new media, which is like social media, phones, you know, apps, um, this is now delivering a lot of information uh, to people and it's crowdsourced and not regulated. And so it's very different than what we used to get from what I would call traditional media, which would be regular TV and radio, right? And so now people are getting a lot of stuff that's been peer shared or generated by the public. And while that has a lot of advantages and is the quantity of information goes up exponentially when you've now empowered everyone basically to be able to um, transmit ideas and, um, you know, memes can become, uh, you know, viral information can move really fast. So it's interesting in an age of a virus, you also have information that's accelerating and um, the user then has to control where they're getting information and how much. And this is very different from when we were passive and you only had, you know, back when I was a kid, three channels to watch. And so that certain information came and someone else was really regulating the information and you were taking in what you could take in or you had a, a small choice between the, you know, three different channels. So, and when we looked in this research article, the, the new media rather than the traditional was more associated with negative affect, depression, anxiety, and stress. And so viewing, especially the stressful count content was associated with more negative affect and depression. Um, and then overall, just more media engagement was associated with negative affect, anxiety, stress. And but the counterpoint is viewing heroic acts, speeches from experts and knowledge of the disease and prevention were associated with more positive affect and less depression. So, you know, the media is really powerful in terms of good media can inform people and actually seems to can it seems to have a positive effect on how they feel but negative media um, seems to have a quite strong effect and we'll get more into this but i think that's been you know found elsewhere and, and is sort of one of the uh, realities of our new uh, world with uh, information flow and p potentially toxic information or information overload being being a problem so we're going to uh, move to some of the pre-COVID uh, problems that I think have been exacerbated or made worse. Um, you know, this is uh, a list that's from uh, this Dyke Drummond book about stop physician burnout. So, you know, like I said, it's an American problem, but it's 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 occurring everywhere. So it is a, uh, a problem around the world. And physician burnout, you know, is uh, associated with all sorts of bad outcomes. And so right now we have a situation of a lot of doctors, you know, not uh, being very happy and, you know, I feel like pushed into live lives that are very stressful and difficult and um, sort of having to live their daily existence in a way that's not in tune with how people really should be living or, or, or were made to live. Back to the news, um, this Hans Rosling, uh, Rosling book is excellent, Factfulness, and he talks about how we have um, instincts or programs in us that miss uh, that that overemphasize some of the negatives in the news, and that a lot of people, even very well informed people, think the world is a lot worse and doing worse than it really is. And you have to step back and think that the news business uh, focuses mostly on the negative because gradual progress or good things that happens for the most part is not news. And so if you're watching the news, you may think you're getting sort of smarter, 
but in fact, you're kind of not getting smarter because mostly you're just learning about bad things and you're not learning about good things. Plus, there's been a really poor translation at times of scientific research, which I think in the age of COVID is certainly a, a major issue. People thirst for information, but um, if they get their information from the wrong uh, resource or if people are translating science poorly, it's a problem. I put in this uh, little uh, thing from The Onion, which is a humorous uh, article, aspirin taken daily with bottle of bourbon reduces awareness of heart attacks. It sounds good, but it's, you know, the awareness of heart attacks is not important. So anyway, even print media does distort and print media has a history of distortion also, but you can imagine now on social media and on with these new forms of transmission that this is all accelerated. And content matters and bad content is stronger than good. So this Netflix series, uh, 13 Reasons Why, there was a spike in suicides, you know, following uh, the release of the series. And by the count of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal, you know, research article, I think it was 94 uh, extra suicides sort of occurred in that time. I mean, that's obviously an estimate. It's hard to, you know, they have to do these scatter plots and try to figure out when people downloaded it. Um, but content matters and bad stuff sticks with us. Like the worst day, one day of your life can cause PTSD that lasts for years or trauma reactions that last for years. Whereas a good day tends to not have as such strong and lasting uh, impact. So I, I like to put Edward Howell's book up and have people reflect on it a little bit. He talks about frazzing, which is frantic, ineffectual, multi, ineffective multitasking. And so today we are doing a lot and sort of taxing our brains in ways that we never could before because you just couldn't have that much information coming in in such a short period of time. And everyone's attention is shrinking because there's more targets, there's more things that we can look for. Plus, there's a lot of thieves who want to steal our attention. Um, and so basically that's like, you know, corporate interests. I mean, there's a lot of business models that are based on people getting inside our head and a lot of those companies have a lot of money. But the, the thing that's really amazing about this book is that Hollowell said this in 2006. That was before this, that we had iPhones. That was before everything was on a phone. And so if we were crazy busy then, you know, what are we now? And um, if you want a really nice book on how the mind works, the Galawi and Rosen, uh, the distracted mind goes into it. And basically one of the underpinnings of the book is that we are foraging animals. And in the past, we probably used to forage for berries or other kind of things. And so we have a um, desire to bring new things and it works also for information. So we like to look at new information, try to figure out what's there. We get bored with that, we go somewhere else. You know, So if things keep hitting, of course, people who run media systems use this against us because they keep giving us little uh, enticements to keep going and to stay on their programs. Um, but uh, the ways our brains are made, we only have so much top down, but we do have top down cognitive control. We have bottom up sensory inputs, uh, what in, we may call interoception, um, but we have a lot of interruptions and distractions. And so interruptions would be something that if you hear a door ring or you hear a sound, you intentionally move to it. And a distraction is something that you're trying to ignore, um, but is still getting into your consciousness and, and making you distracted. And in Florida, you'll notice, you can see there um, on the left of the screen, there's a little picture, a caution sign with the picture of the alligator. When you're, uh, and this is Mayaka uh, River State Park, when you go to this state park, you don't just go and jump in the water. You gotta scan around, and you're probably not gonna be uh, swimming there, but you're gonna walk up and look around because there's alligators, right? So you scan, and this is the type of uh, attention that we were evolved for is this scanning, but you can only scan so much of it and you can only sustain it for so long. Um, and so this is the reality of sort of how our uh, attention systems were built for these natural environments and the digital environments can easily overwhelm them. And obviously we have lots of things going on that are gonna cause us stress these days. We have economic hardships, obviously with COVID that has increased uh, unstable living, unstable social supports. I mean, so a lot of people have uh, sort of families have been fragmented. Uh, living in working environments has changed 
in some ways, in, uh, sometimes in negative ways. Time pressures, we've always had in certain situations, they might be worse. Lack of control, clearly there's a lot of things that are going on that are mass phenomenon that are individuals don't control. Uh, sleep, trauma, mental chatter, so the internal dialogue that we have, uh, you know, it stresses us more. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons that just in general, the world was becoming more stressful, but then now you've thrown in a pandemic. Uh, if you want a great book on circadian rhythms, uh, Sasha and Pando's The Circadian Code goes through all of the um, latest science on it. And I have a little bit from an article there just showing a bit of the graph on how we change over time. So clearly the uh, our, our biology is made to move naturally with uh, with the cycles of nature and we've disturbed it in modern living and I think that that has caused some pretty significant health issues for us. And to show you how complicated things are, I find this to be a neat article. It's the bi-directional associations between sleep and, and physical activity in adolescence and what it says is basically if the more you exercise, the better you're going to sleep that day. And so exercise is a, a important component to help your body and brain be ready to sleep. Then on the flip side is if you don't get good sleep, you tend not to exercise as much the next day. So there's a cycle and your lack of sleep can disturb your exercise and getting sleep can make you sleep better and they're all intertwined. Some of the some basics about the human body also that seems to be neglected in, in the modern world. Uh, Wolf's law, bones strengthened with a repeated load. And um, from Primate Change, which is Vivar Cregan Reed's book, uh, this is a picture of the bone densities over time. And you'll notice that the modern bones are less dense. So the uh, our ancestors used to pound their bones all the time just to survive. And in the modern world, we're not doing it and, and hence, you know, weakening our system. Um, Davis's law, which is another uh, time tested old uh, known phenomenon about the human body is that tendons and tissues stretch when used and contract and weaken when not used. And you have to use all of your body in order to uh, have it all work the way that it's supposed to. And this James Levine book, Get Up, uh, why your chair is killing you and what you can do about it is a pretty good look at it. Um, you know, and then think to yourself, what two angles is the chair creating and which muscles and tendons will shorten and weaken due to time in a chair? And we're all experiencing that on a, on a major level. And clearly this is something that we need to uh, think about when we're designing our lives. This is a, a picture. Um, I don't know if the humor will translate from the title of the slide, but get scared sitless. We really would like people to sit less. Um, and this shows you, this is from the Lancet 2018, but the prevalence of back pain, you know, is, is really high and it's incredibly high even in younger populations. You know, that we're up to, uh, a tw you know, over a 20% average in the 10 to 19 year olds. So even at the beginning of life, people are starting to have problems due to you know the ways that we've distorted our body and too much sedentary behavior. Um, and so now that we've gone through a lot of the problems, uh, let me get to solutions or my take on things. Um, I would rather be approximately right than precisely wrong. It seems in a lot of the modern world, everyone is getting very caught up on small data points and um, making more of them than they really should. I think we need to step back and look at the basics of health. Uh, I have three rules. One is eat food, two is move, and three is honor silence. If you just follow those three rules, I think you're going to be pretty good. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on food, but basically the eat food rule is eat minimally processed whole foods whenever possible. So if you're leaning towards that and that's what's going in your body, that's going to help you. Highly processed food causes all sorts of problems. That's for another presentation, but you know, there you go. So, um, Sometimes I ask audiences or my patients, you know, how do fish spend their time? They usually understand fish swim all the time. So they'll say swimming, say, what do birds do? Most birds can fly. So they'll be like, they fly. And then I'll say, what do you do? 
and it'll make them think because they're still most of the time and most of that time is in a chair. And it's just clear that that's not how we're made. If you see the Tara Humara runner there um, and uh, ultra marathoner Scott Jurek, um, who were made, they, these two were made famous by the book uh, Born to Run. Um, we're really made to move and walking and running has to be part of our life. Here's the two two of my favorite books. And then to, to circle back to COVID, a uh, recent article that uh, older adults who regularly engaged in either vigorous or moderately vigorous physical activity during quarantine scored higher in resilience, positive affect and lower in depressive symptoms. And so that's from Spain. Um, but in this time of being restricted, we need to still figure out how to ways to move our bodies or we're going to have problems related to it. Um, and Go Wild is not just about movement. I'll show John Raddy, one of the authors, is a movement specialist and has all sorts of great mental, you know, has a has has written a book called Spark, which goes through all the mental health implications and cognitive implications of of exercise. And so um, these are two of my favorites. And clearly we need to keep moving even when we have uh, restrictions. Um, Katie Bowman is the person I referenced at the beginning, and I kind of stole the don't just sit there from her. Uh, if you go to nutritiousmovement.com, you know, that's her blog. These are two of her books. I mean, she's a, she's amazing and probably the most articulate um, spokesperson for moving in a what she would call a nutritious way, having all the parts of your body move and also figuring how we can get out of our movement uh, restricted culture and that we have to move, get back to a way where moving is normal and that we need to spend our time uh, moving. And she's talking, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at a standing desk and uh, I have a, um, a number of props that I use to help me move a little. I have a little half cone that I'm standing on to stretch my calves uh, as we speak. So there's things that you can do to help your workstation get better. And she, this is what she talks about. Um, she also has the idea of stacking your life. And so this is a the hang bar, uh, you know, at the top of the stairs. They're ready. Every time you go by, you can go for a swing or do a few pull-ups and the little balance bar as you brush your teeth. And so these are just examples of how people can work on things and put it in their life. And so they, they need to walk them up and down the stairs anyway. They're going to be there. You might as well take a little swing and that you can... Um, while you're brushing your teeth, work on your balance. These are a couple of workstations. That's Katie Bowman right there with, with her kids. And so she likes to get old tables and use them to be on the ground. And then she has like a bolster or a, a cushion under her, you know, if needed. Obviously, a lot of people these days in the Western world, especially, can't go to the ground and get back up. So sadly, we've lost that ability because we don't do it every day. And so we used to squat. We used to be on the ground a lot. And as people age, they get less and less comfortable with that. Um, this is another workstation possibility. So once again, you can this one more fully shows you the bolster. A lot of us need a bolster or something to keep us upright and have us be comfortable. But in some ways, you're sort of stretching if you do it right, depending on how you situate yourself, you're stretching while you work. And so then you're kind of getting a workout uh, while you're uh, doing your work. All right, so I said my three rules, you know, eat food, move, and then rule number three is honor silence. So what do I mean by that? Well, first off, sleep. I mean, we talked about the Panda book on the, uh, on the uh, regarding the fact that we have these circadian rhythms that are super important. And um, you got the picture of the puppies right in front. And to sleeping together seems to be better. So we people people being together seems to help us sleep. But also we need to get the electronics out of our, our out of our room. Uh, Lauren Hale, who's a sleep researcher, says desist, dampen, and dim. Desist means stop using electronics. Uh, uh, you know, an hour or two before bedtime. Dim meaning turn down the light on your electronics so you don't get the blue light in. And dampen means don't do. Um, things that are psychologically arousing, like video games are very arousing before going to bed. And then also uh, things like social media for some people rev them up. So don't do that before you go to bed or it's gonna not just take away your quantity of sleep, but will reduce your quality. And sleep is just so important and, and, and has so many ramifications. So just breathe. I mean, but one thing about honoring silence is, is tuning into ourselves. We're not often present with ourselves. We don't breathe the way probably nature intended and that we should. 
Um, I do a lot of breathing exercises with patients. It's super important and it can elicit the relaxation response. And if you have constant stress during your day without air, without times of relaxation, then your life is going to be out of balance and your physiology is about, a, about out of balance. And so um, not time for a breathing exercise today, but I, those are super important. We need to be smart. David Allen and many other people have written these sort of productivity books, which I find to be really uh, helpful and neat. So, you know, his getting things done has lots of different steps, but in terms of managing workflow like capture, clarify, organize, reflect, and engage, he's just proposing that we need to get a, a system where we get all our ideas down because the world and our lights are so complicated that the human brain is not made to control everything. And then what, you, what he says you're aiming for is a mind like water. So once you've done all your stuff, then you, you know where your workflow is, you feel comfortable about it, about it. You don't have things on your mind making you anxious. And then therefore your mind's like water. Something comes in and you can return to stillness. So um, David Allen or other uh, of his ilk are, are uh, excellent sources to help get you uh, doing well. So uh, ingrained unhealthy regimens. I mean, we have all of us, myself included, have things we do that are not healthy and when we, we for doctors we're always telling people like oh for your patients you got to be empathetic and accept uh, accepting and positive well you also have to be that for yourself and that's the hard thing for people sometimes is to be empathetic accepting and positive towards themselves and not everyone is interested or ready for change including you so you don't need to you know uh, change everything all at once and uh, reinforces keep things going. So understand what are the patterns in your social environment and phys physical environment that sustain whatever patterns you have. And if you feel that there's patterns that are not working for you, then that's where you need to change. All right. So solutions and strategies. One, you know, in this world we live in, prioritize your cognitive energy towards the important stuff. Avoid making lots of little decisions. Stick on your big decisions. Chunk your work into intervals. Uh, you can set a timer and then break it up with diversions, uh, physical activity, creative stuff, manage information flow with some kind of a system that helps you organize, minimize your distractions such as multiple streams of information, pop-ups and notifications. All that is just going to set you back. Uh, use technology to provide limits. Uh, we, for kids, we'd say it's parental controls, but we can control on ourselves, like setting timers and just uh, removing all, let's say, your social media to one tablet or phone or one place where you're not always accessing it. We tell kids no TV or video games in the bedroom or on no, none of those on school nights. Probably good to say for ourselves. Just say no to things that might be a problem for you. And I think more, may I bolded it, so maybe most important is create diverse offline interests. So lots of different things that are outside and can move you around. In the age of COVID, it's hard to do that and people don't always have uh, access to it. But, you know, um, as this clears and as, as we have more uh, capability, we probably need more outside things like gardening, going for walks, social events that bring people together, po you know, creating positive social uh, and cultural activities. Um, and so those are super important and will help us get sort of off the screens. We need the screens for work. We're going to be forced in, to have them in front of us, but we really need to have it in balance, right? So we need to have the right amount and not too much and not the type of content that's going to stress us out. So I believe I'm right on time and uh, I think I was one minute ahead <laughs> and I have some more slides, but this is really the end of the presentation. Um, I have some extra slides if people ask questions that are that are pertinent. This is my email if anyone wants to get in touch with me uh, directly. Um, but I guess we're ready for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kalibe, for that excellent presentation. I think you made some really great observations of uh, some of the daily challenges we are all facing uh, because of this ongoing pandemic and how we could probably build resilience and our coping capacities. So um, I'm going to start with a few questions uh, we have. Um, how often do you think should people be standing up as opposed to sitting all day when working in an office environment? Well, well that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the I, I don't know that there's a formula, but the problem is more about stillness than it is about sitting or standing. 
And so I think if you have the ability to toggle back and forth a little bit from sitting and standing, standing all day also will cause you health problems. Um, and so it just kind of depends on, you know, could you have a workstation on the floor where you're sort of sitting, but you're stretching a little bit and then you stand some. But I think there's no way around that many of us are just going to be too still. And that's sort of the fundamental issue. And so I don't want to brush that aside. But I think then once again, people have constraints of what their work situation is and what they can do. Um, but I would I would sort of guess that overall for most of us, most of the time, you'd probably like to be standing more than you're sitting if, if you're sort of forced to choose between the two. Um, but with the caveat that if that if it's a chair, if you're going all the way to the ground and you're kind of able to sort of stretch at the same time, then I think, you know, maybe you can aim towards more like a 50 50. That's my guess. Thank you so much. So one of the other things that I was uh, also um, you know, wanted to ask you was you talked a little bit about the stress and the stigma that is associated for healthcare workers. So do you have any advice to them about what they possibly could do in terms of their daily struggles that cause all of the stress? Well, I think a lot of the stuff I've included in the presentation would be what I would ask uh, people to do, which is back off from their um, ex from media use that's that they may find stressful or or might be sort of you know harmful to them. So that's one. Uh, make sure that they get all the physical activity and um, all the uh, 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 diverse ways that they can move their body. And then they have to kind of have a practice of some type of relaxation. You know, for some people it's prayer, for some people it's meditation, for some people it's breathing exercises. I think you need to work in things that lower your stress level. Um, so, you know, that, that would be it. And then I think for, um, you know, we don't want to underestimate the power of social activities. And so, you know, having, keeping, even when it's more difficult, keeping social um, activities in your life, even if it has to be through like a phone or a computer or, or whatever means that you have, uh, keeping those connections together, I think is very important. Thank you. So the one of the other challenges has been, as all of us know, is we have, the lockdown measures have been so drastic in many cases and yes they were needed and we might have to start some of them soon as the newspapers were just talking this morning again it's the media but we are getting some news that you know there's been a 15 percent rise rise in cases since late spring and we are hoping it won't bring with it all uh, the mortality that it did in um, you know late winter and early spring but the in trying to lock down people in all the physical distancing that we are doing, we lose out on many of the social interactions that we've been so used to and that have kept us going uh, on a daily basis. Is there some outlet in terms of how maybe we could have better interactions despite the distancing and despite the uh, masking? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that because it seems like we, you know, humans thirst for real contact and to be close to each other. And, and so I don't know that anything uh, can really replicate that. But I do think that once again, to get back to, you know, if you're doing positive uh, media and you're making a real effort to recharge yourself with your, you know, p reaching out to people who you have a, a good social bond with, making sure, you know, scheduling. I, I think one of the, the things we maybe fail to do is to schedule times where we're going to get in contact with the people who are important to us. And I think that in our daily grind, or if we're feeling stressed out, we can get frantic and then maybe, you know, not, not videos chat with your mom or not reach out to your friend or not do the things that you could do, you know? So I think we need to be more deliberate and more careful about reaching out to people um, and use the technologies that we have to do it. But, 
you know, it's going to be hard when you can't give someone a hug and you can't see them in person and everyone's masked up to really, you know, have, have the same type of social interactions you did before. I will say that that now streaming like classes, exercise classes is, is now, you know, become much more popular and there's many more available. There's also streaming music that you can basically attend a concert, you know, in New Orleans or wherever, you know, uh, for for free, mostly. You know, you can go on like YouTube and and Facebook and these other apps and and, you know, get great music beamed right into your house, you know, at, at, at home. So, you know, I think other things that uh, we could do is just try to n try to if we're going to get on social media, do it in a way that's like positive and making the world a better place and being thoughtful about what we post. I think a lot of what stresses people out about social media, you notice from the survey, it seem, does seem to be, is that a lot of people are posting in ways that are not careful and are, you know, uh, revving things up and making things more divisive. And we're all very stressed right now. So we're very primed to, you know, want to try to find an enemy or someone to blame or say, so, you know, someone to, uh, you know, be the, reason that things have gone bad and i think that there's no you know clearly that we have this multifactorial uh complex you know uh, pandemic that we're in and there's not going to be a single easy you know person to blame so let's not you know demonize and and be us first them that just stresses us out more and i think is working against us sort of feeling better and coping with the pandemic thank you and uh in keeping in line with what you were saying is um, one of the challenges we all face these days also is we have electronics at our fingertips and we are constantly on call with having our phones with us, other smart devices, and we don't seem to be able to turn them off. And so do you have any suggestions for? Well, um, I, yeah, <laughs> I have a, you're right. It's like I got my phone right here. So the, it is a problem and many of us, uh, you know, are for work. I mean, I, a lot of times I have to be 24 seven with my phone. So it is, it is a problem and we do need to manage it. I like people that I like that, you know, I have a number of colleagues that do like a sun, take Sunday off from electronics. So you could do like a one day a week fast where you do no electronics for a day, or you could make it just no phone uh, for a day. You could set time. You can have your phone sort of turn off and turn back on at a certain time. So you're sort of managing when. Um, yes, you you have to be proactive about those things. If you let the devices just keep growing and growing, you're be going to become more a prisoner to them. And so you, you're right that it's it's difficult and but it takes thoughtful management. Um, and you can there are settings on your own device that you can use to help limit, you know, to have it turn off automatically or. Uh, limit calls in. So yeah, that that's that's my suggestion. And uh, thank you for for that um, great way of t telling us how maybe we could do better with some of our devices. Uh, one of the I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I know you had talked about this earlier, but are some of our partners and you know many of the people that we work with live in cities that are very congested. And you don't really have the opportunity to go outside and sometimes even walk or run because of all the traffic and the lack of parks and, and many of those other issues that come in environments such as these. So what advice would you have for people who live in apartments and in congested cities? Yeah, it, well, it's a it's a difficult reality. It really is. And I, I don't know that there's any easy answer to that. I think if you're um, looking at sort of inspiration for how to think about nature and nature exposure, there's an there's an author named Richard Louvre who's who's written some great books on nature and how important it is. And so, you know, on one thing, uh, so one side, one answer to your question, and one thing is like, you know, maybe we do need to sort of prioritize like getting out and getting away and figuring out ways that we can do that when that's safe and possible. So I would just say, well, you know, when it's safe and possible, if people can get out of the city or if they're going to spend their resources, have it, put, spend it in a way to get themselves into a nature filled environment. Indoor plants, I mean, they've been shown to be soothing windows, more natural light exposure, more. So is there is are there ways that you can take your physical environment that's urban 
and you know, I think basically harsh, you know, a lot of us live in kind of harsher environments and soften it a little bit with some natural elements. I think that could be possible for some people. Um, and then it, once again, I think it's like, you're gonna have to meditate and, you know, do yoga and keep yourself calm and sort of keep having these practices to calm yourself and work through the pandemic. And, uh, you know, sadly, I think for a lot of people, it's like their only relief will come you know, when things are safe and they can move around. So, you know, if you can renature your apartment environment and make it as natural as possible, that's probably the best that you can do. Thank you. Um, you had also touched on the news media and how the news media has become 24 seven and there's this constant barrage of news that is negative because I guess it tends to get more attention. Um, and some, you know, the, and the positive news gets sidelined. It's it's very hard for most of us to, I guess, get off that media thing. And do you have any suggestions in terms of maybe what are the news outlets that we might have more positive news from or be able to um, extract better news? Yeah, well, I do think that people should probably pick a small number of outlets that they trust and they feel like gives good news and really try not to access the ones that are you know, of lesser quality or are more sensationalistic. Um, so they think that that you know you do you have once again new kind of thing you need to think through in the modern day. You know, do I want to subscribe to this or that paper or this or that you know news service or cable news? You know, is that something that I want in my life and is that going to make me better? If people want an exercise to get them off of reading the newspaper, all they need to do is spend a week of reading a one week old newspaper for read the old one week old newspaper for one week. And I think, you know, you know if you feel like, re, you know, uh, reading newspapers is not, is stressing you out more than, you know, you know, more than it should, that exercise will show you that in a week, most of the stuff is really not that important anymore. And, and it's sort of, a, you know, wasting your time a little bit. And I think, newspapers are a higher quality source than most of the nightly news and so if you're if you if you you know we don't have the you could i guess in theory record the nightly news and then watch it a week later um but i but i think you know the the time uh you know the time uh, that any of that stuff is important is usually so small with most of what they show um i think the other thing though as i'm trying to emphasize in my presentations is we just have to realize that mostly it's bad news. Mostly it's all the negative stuff from all over the world. And that's their economic model. If they're a for profit, you know, I mean, PBS in the States and there's other places that have uh, not for profit news that is not built on advertising. And so that's a different story with them. But for the ones built on advertising, they want you watching and they know if they show something that's sensationalist that you will watch more, you know, disasters drive up their ratings and bad news drives up their ratings. And so I think we we do need to opt. We don't need to get all the news all the time, too. I, I record like the Sun, the Friday uh, PBS News Hour, and I usually watch the Friday one. You know, it's one hour of a nonprofit news. But so people, I think, need to set up some kind of system like that where they know what they're going to watch and they sort of try to uh, restrict themselves to a limited amount of news. Um, the, my only counterpoint would be in the time of a pandemic, when there's stuff going on, especially in the beginning of this, I think, you know, there was some value. And so I do have to say when disasters are occurring, when things are going on actively, sometimes watching the news is just our only way to quickly get information that maybe can be helpful for us. But I think, you know, the vast majority of the time you can set up a routine that that gets you what you need and doesn't get you too much. Thank you. And um, one of the last questions I had was uh, that work is getting busier for everybody. There is, you know, there are different projects. You have families at home, you have children to take care of, and you have limited resources right now. How do people maintain their mental health when, uh, you know, there are so many different things pulling us in all different directions? Well, it's difficult. I feel especially troubled by families that are in small urban environments, especially with young kids, uh, to be in an apartment with a large 
amount of people and not be restricted in terms of that's a that's a tough challenge. And then I mean, for a lot of families to teach now to have to teach your kids school in addition to doing all the work you're doing, you're right that the that the load has become very high for a lot of people. And um, yeah, it's it is quite stressful and it really is a difficult situation. I think once again, I mean, it's all going to come back to controlling the things that you can control and letting go of things that you don't control and you can control how much you you know how much time you spend relaxing and meditating and you know doing the things that calm you and you can minimize doing the things that stress you more obviously the stress level is going to be high for a lot of people the other thing like i said with that uh, if you look at david allen's book or there's another there's a number of other free to focus by hyatt there's a lot of books on productivity and they're and they're all kind of saying the same thing get what you need write it down capture it you know have a system to make you productive and have you not stress out so so um so w one of the um questions we have from our, our audience is in terms of science um what other evidence do you have in terms of what works well, I think that there's a lot of evidence about meditation. So mindful meditation is really works quite well and has been shown to sort of help with psychological health, physiologic stress. Um, you know, so that's a part that, you know, that you can, you, you know, they, there's lots of good studies on meditation. And so mindful meditation in particular. So the mindfulness meditation is the one that's been studied the most. And most recently, so if you get, you know, like an app that's available, Headspace is one of them, but there's a number of other like apps and almost all of them have a free component. So uh, and online you can you can access a lot of that, too, and that can kind of teach you how to meditate and meditation has a great, uh, you know, evidence base. Breathing exercises have a good evidence base, too, and they're inexpensive, accessible by everyone. Um, you know, back to the physical activity. I mean, part of the problem is, yes, we we don't have a, um, you know, we haven't broken down like exactly what are all the impacts of, you know, spending large amount of times in chairs. It does seem associated with all sorts of really bad things, but no, we haven't gone and studied it because there's, you know, that wasn't the kind of studies that didn't be very hard to control. Are you gonna, how are you gonna force, how are you gonna figure out you know, you can't control people's lives, kind of, it's all naturalistic. And so um, a lot of the movement stuff is behind in terms of like an evidence base about exactly what you want to do. But it is very clear that if you don't move and actively, you know, sort of use all the parts of your body, you will weaken and become, you know, uh, but reduce your range of motion and, ha and eventually have health problems associated with it. Um, so I don't think you need a study on that. Um, and then Cognitive therapy, which is the most evidence-based psychotherapy, is all based on the idea of, you know, change your behaviors and change your thoughts, and you will therefore get control over your emotions. And so the evidence base for the fact of how you think reflects how you feel is, is, is huge, you know. So you can just look into the evidence base for cognitive behavioral therapy, and so that when you move, when you are, at, when you have activities, they change how you feel. When you have thoughts, they change how you uh, feel, and you can work on either of those to sort of get people to sort of feel better or handle things better. So in terms of anxiety, especially during you know a pandemic, uh, our, our thoughts very easily take off on their own and go to places that are uh, you know much more negative than they need to be. And you can kind of you know cognitive therapy teaches you that how you think is important and how to think realistically. Um, and so ever, anyone can do it. Uh, but if you need help with someone, someone can help you do it really well and become good at it. And then, you know, if you have a if you have a problem where you need professional help, that's usually where they go. Thank you. And one last question before we end has to do with uh, breathing exercises. Is that something that you would uh, recommend in terms of people? I absolutely recommend breathing exercises. So it's diaphragmatic breathing. Really deep into your stomach slow, but then a very slow exhale. Like that slow. 
So those are the kind of breathing exercises. So if you do a very diaphragmatic breathing slowly, but with a, with a slower exhale, and there's a lot of different formulas, maybe like four inhale, hold for four, breathe out for eight. That's a classic one. Uh, so you have these slow exhales and it turns on the vagus nerve, which goes up through your heart and lungs to your brainstem and it lowers your blood pressure, lowers your pulse, you know, lowers your arousal level. So absolutely breathing exercises are wonderful and we need to be, they need to be more widely implemented because there's something we can control because otherwise you can't really control your autonomic system. You don't sort of directly tell your heart rate to slow down, but your breathing is the one piece of the system that you can uh, use to control. So there you go. Thank you again for that really interesting presentation for answering all of our questions. Um, I think with this, we will now end our session. I just wanted all of our um, audience that is part of this presentation that the presentation is recorded and will be available to you uh, to view soon. And we will be sending a link to that. Also, please let all your colleagues and friends know that they can access the presentation as well. And um, we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks again, Dr. Kalibe, for a great presentation. Oh, thank you.